So this is, uh, it's quite an honor to be able to talk to this group. I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to give you just a little snapshot of a recent project that we've kicked off called Water for the Seasons. And it's very relevant for this area. Um, it's really trying to bring, integrate um, the hard, the physical science part of, of the challenge of looking at droughts and other um, water resource issues with uh, the socioeconomic policy issues that go around managing water. So all the issues that you're all very familiar with. So this is really a collaborative approach. We have strong engagement with many of you who are in the room. Um, as a matter of fact, Jason is uh, <laughs> um, on our uh, stakeholder affiliate group, uh, working with water managers and water right holders and a whole bunch of scientists, uh, hydroclimatic modelers, to understand the impact of drought. Um, this, this is a, a collaborative project between uh, University of Nevada, Reno, Desert Research Institute, um, Ohio University, where Derek just ran off to, and uh, the US Geological Survey. So we're looking at the challenges of drought and other uh, major extreme events on the Truckee Carson River system, not just because we're here, but because we have essentially every possible imaginable challenge in managing water all in a very compact area from our lovely area up here in Tahoe. Um, the water flows out of Tahoe sometimes, um, not right now because it's below the rim, so if you all go to Tahoe City Dam at some point on one of your tours, you will see essentially no water coming out of Lake Tahoe. That's the only exit from Lake Tahoe. So Tahoe is the single biggest reservoir capacity on this entire system. We have about 750,000 acre feet of storage capacity in Tahoe, which is the top six feet. 50% of that goes up in, in uh, evaporation during the course of the year. The rest of it goes down the Truckee system in one of the most highly regulated water systems in the entire West, um, which includes a series of Bureau of Reclamation, Army Corps dams, um, and eventually flowing into a terminal lake, which has obviously no exit, um, owned um, by a native an Indian tribe, the Pyramid Paiute, with two endangered species. Um, so, that's a lot of challenges for water. Um, that's only 100 miles away. Um, also, in addition to that, there is the first Bureau of Reclamation project ever built in the United States, which was a canal diverting water from the Truckee River to green the desert in what was called the Newlands Project, which is where we would be growing alfalfa if there was any water going to the farmers in that area this year. Um, it connects to the Carson River, which is essentially unregulated. No um, water management physical infrastructure in the top part of the Carson River. Um, so the Carson River f flows essentially freely, um, mixing heavily with groundwater. More agriculture in this area, major uh, urban areas, and tribal governments. So in this area, in the Truckee Carson River system, we're essentially looking at all the major challenges you could have in a western region climate system, a western region river system. And we're trying to look at options to build in resiliency to these types of system by using this as a pilot study system. Okay, so everybody mentioned uh, Governor Sandoval um, speaking at uh, Lahant Reservoir. Last year, well, this is a Lahunt Reservoir as of October. It's even lower than this now. Um, but let me put the drought that we're in in perspective, okay? So when you think about droughts here, droughts are not a new phenomenon to the West, as most of you know. Um, so if we step way back in time, but relevant, okay, relevant, in the medieval period, um, there was a paleo, what they called mega drought, in this area. It lasted about 250 years. So that's why you see tree stumps at the bottom of Fallen uh, Leaf Lake and the south end of Lake Tahoe. Um, large tree stumps. They grew during that period when the lake was a 
was at much lower level. Okay, so um, for my colleagues in Oklahoma, also putting in perspective the Dust Bowl. The Dust Bowl wasn't just the worst um, times ever experienced in Oklahoma. It was a severe drought here, lasting nearly 20 years. The Dust Bowl period is a drought that we're particularly interested in because it, it happened before a lot of the development occurred out here. And so in that context, that was a severe drought. Now, it wasn't just, just dry periods. It was dry periods punctuated by extreme storms in the middle of that, um, both in Oklahoma and out here. Um, obviously, the current drought, which is four years, feels extreme right now. Um, we had a pretty substantial drought here. Um, our longest in recent record was 86 to 94, which was about seven years. Um, the current four-year drought is worse than that, and obviously we're not sure where we're going with that. And then there are droughts that we see in the record um, when we look at the global climate models um, that look like some of these periods, not as extensive as any uh, of the earlier two, but we know that droughts are one thing that is showing up in the global climate models. So one of the goals of our project is to really understand working with the stakeholders and working with the hydroclimatic modelers, what constitutes a drought resilient community. These are aspects of, that you have all just been discussing in, in terms of the drought forum. Understanding, acknowledging, acknowledging, big deal, um, anticipating and absorbing the changing conditions. How do we work with communities who have the ability, so in our case we're focused not so much on the individual public, but we're focused on water managers and water right holders. Um, what is their ability to absorb change? And that changes from group to group. If you're, if you're the Trekking Meadows Water Authority and you have water supply in reservoirs, you have a planning horizon that may be seven years or longer. If you're a farmer and you're facing 50% water allocation yet last year, 25% allocation this year, potentially less um, or no allocation next year, your planning horizon is, is you know, one or two years, in which case you wind up in crisis. So understanding when communities go to the brink of crisis Stepping back from that and understanding what actions can be taken to build in resiliency. And really building in this capability to adapt, but not just adapt to where you are. Resiliency is really about that ability to necessarily move to a new state. You may do business differently. You may implement planning differently. It, it was what Mike Teague said, how do I get my communities to new, move to the recognition that drought is something we're going to be living with, even if it rains one year. So this is what our project is focused on. Um, we will be sharing this information, obviously, with our partners here, and welcome the opportunity to share it with any of uh, the members of this forum and the other states in the area. And we'd also like to learn from you as we move forward with this project. So, so I'm, going to talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we've integrated the data um, because this is really is an integrated model. We're attempting to bring together um, social sciences as well as biophysical. I'm a policy analyst, so I'm very interested in the idea of resilience within a policy system. Can we actually get the system itself that allocates water, whether it's proper water rights themselves or water markets and water banks, to adapt to these new types of conditions? So it's a very complex integrated project. We have groundwater models, multiple a suite of groundwater models. We have a suite of surface water models as well. And we have one operating model on our system. Um, so we have our biophysical models that we're going to go ahead and hit with different uh, variation to hydroclimatic conditions. We're gonna give them reactive inputs for our stakeholders to look at and then react to. And we're gonna ask them specifically, how do you adapt to this condition and what actually challenges and breaks you down? What does your resilience that you have embedded in the system disappear? When are you at a crisis for that individual unit that you manage? Um, we're also trying to um, look at different um, climatic conditions. So this is precipitation, snowpack, and temperature. We're gonna keep that as simple as we can. 
uh, because those all have pretty active, very um, large impacts on the hydrological models overall. But we're, our focus on the hydrology, so we're, we're looking specifically at what types of water resources do you have as an end user on the system. And we've embedded, we've embedded into this um, quite a bit of social science. So we're looking at two levels of actors on our system. So organizations, those managers that have official responsibilities and some flexibility, and then actual water right holders. So we're primarily looking at agricultural in, in this, in the simulations we're going to run here, because we think they are probably at the will we know they're at the cutting edge of where the resilience in the system breaks down. We have a stakeholder advisory group that's going to that's going to help us generate these hydroclimatic scenarios. So it's going to be able to tell us directly under what conditions do you want to see us run the model. So it's actively collaborative modeling. I threw up my um, also definition of resilience. We talk about it a lot as a term. We don't think about it actively as an academic. It's fundamentally different from sustainability, and it's fundamentally different from robustness of a system. So it's that idea that embedded in it is that ability to change to new conditions. So we don't just bounce back from the drought, but go back to something new where we're actually managing water, frankly, very differently. Um, let me go forward because I want to leave plenty of time for Q&A. Um, we can talk about some of the characteristics we're looking at on this project, uh, resilience. I think that people know the terminology. Um, I will, I'll just skip through these very briefly. So the way it feeds into the people selected here, we're interested in who uses information and how. So we're actively asking every user on the system, uh, where do you get your information about hydrology? How do you use it? And what would you like to see into the future if the hydrology changes? We're looking at what the diversity of interests are. We want to see how interaction and innovation occurs in the system. We generally know from resilience theory that highly centralized systems tend to be less resilient than decentralized systems. We're looking at something called redundancy and modularity. So do you have one agency that manages a primary function on the system? We have a lot of functions with Western Water. Or do you have multiple agencies that, that, that can then serve as backups when one, one aspect of it breaks down? We're looking at trust explicitly. So do you trust the other actors? Who do you interact with? How do you interact with them? What are the problems fundamentally in the social capital on the system? And we're looking whether or not they've responded to change in the past. So the best way to figure out if somebody's responded to drought is to say, give the last drought that occurred. I'm from Sacramento originally. I remember the 1970s, say water shower with a friend. We have droughts here every 20, 30 years. So did you respond to drought? Um, that tells a lot about what's going to happen in the future. So um, effective policy solutions. We are asking explicitly, what can you do under these scenarios? I'm just going to flip through these really briefly, mainly because all I want to do is show the, the mosaic of choices that we have. Response and adaption is fundamentally about choice. What can you do under these conditions? Some of these choices we don't want to have to deal with. So this would be things like ag abandonment, and we actually don't talk about in friendly settings in Nevada. I think we're all among friends. Someone's going to quote me on that, are we? Mm -hmm. um, but there are other other op that's certainly one of the options that we want to see how far can we get into the system before we really get to change the fundamental structure of the economic use of water. Um, I'll just throw these up briefly. So we have lots of potential technological innovations. I would highlight that it's it's a good question to ask why these aren't occurring already in the West where we tend to innovate on all our technology that are fundamental incentive systems out there that are preventing really bringing the forefront of technology to, to drown in water. And this is an active research question that I think this could address more fully. Smart metering and I would say smart monitor, um, monitoring as well as California talks about groundwater. One thing we're thinking about looking at very explicitly is so what's the best way to monitor it where you're not going to have an incentive system for farmers to start hiding their information. Do we have a way to actually put them to reveal in their own self-interest and maintaining groundwater stocks over time? Treating water differently. Now this is both directly treating and also thinking about it. We've already heard about recharge for flood water. How do we deal with those high peaks? Most droughts historically have ended with flood events. Um, this is our 19, well, we've already seen the purple pipes. Certainly looking to places that have had their 14 years of drought, as as Southern Nevada. Um, so four years out, they're not looking at that as particularly a big drought. They're on year 14 now. Um, this is our another way to think about water as really an economic input, not just a natural resource. And then this is our 1997 
flood event in Reno, oh today, I would like to see that, um, with the appropriate infrastructure. So if we're gonna build infrastructure into the future, we wanna be able to utilize those resources for, ground, for groundwater recharge, and here's a, an Arizona groundwater recharge project. Uh, behavioral is key. Um, there's a couple ways we think about this in social sciences. One, getting its incentives aligned. I'm very interested in innovation around drought. I'm very shocked by our incentive system that we've created where very few people have the direct incentive to conserve. So we have a very sort of strangely historic system that's evolved over time where everybody's really incentivized to use, lose, or maybe marginally save a little bit of money, but not very explicitly. Expectations on the system. I think right now, um, one thing that we need to do is set reasonable expectations and policy. Groundwater will not be treated necessarily as a bank without reserves into the future. That's important to signal. Um, expectations cause new dynamics in the systems, both economically and financially. So some of our other ideas, maybe this isn't a drought that will go away and come back every 20 years. Maybe this is a drought that we're going to see every 10. Um, certainly, we need to communicate those very clearly to stakeholders. And this is another, a more tangible idea of expectations. This is an almond field. I like the almond wars in California were quite entertaining from a policy perspective. This is an almond um, orchard being pulled out because somebody made a financial investment with a long-term expectation of water rights that probably wasn't a good, a good expectation to have in, in mind. So we need to have better both models and better ideas of how water is used as its direct inputs. Um, governance matters. I'm going to end it very quickly. Somebody asked, uh, we're, we're talking a lot about water banking and water markets on the system that doesn't have a lot. So localization, we know, is highly critical. Um, not only are each of the states very different, but each of the, the locations are extremely different. When you think about the ecosystem services we manage here on this tiny little 120 mile distant water system, it's Lake Tahoe to Pyramid Lake, which is a terminal lake in the desert. Um, each of those communities has very different uses of water. We're looking at the idea fundamentally, potentially, of even localizing water markets and water banking and even groundwater storage. So could we, could we get that at a very local level? On the other side of that is um, the idea of regionalization. We look at water in the West. Um, it's really important that we start getting these states and communities, and I would even say general localities to talk to each other. We have built this enormous infrastructure for moving water around. There's a policy system on top of that that is still fairly top heavy. Ideally, a really resilient system would be able to have a California farmer be able to talk to a Colorado rancher without going through a lot of red tape and shifting around water rights when they saw the potential to do so. That would be strong level resilience. And we're gonna end on our drought image um, from political, a lot of people see this and see horror. I look at it as a political economist and go, wow, potential for arbitrage. You know, this is high demand areas, low demand areas, places where you potentially trade, store, um, interact with one another, but we need to look at those policy systems that allow that to happen. 